field is changing, as you all know. Uh, this is a, a saying written by a, a person with a disability in Hawaii. He says, in the 1960s, you treated us like plants. You fed us, clothed us, kept us warm, and wheeled us out to feel the sun. In the 70s and 80s, this is when I started working in the field, you discovered we could learn, and we were treated like pets. You taught us all types of tricks, and we stood by your side. But now it's the 1990s. It's not even the 1990s anymore. We're not your class, and we're not your pets. So we think that we know what's best for people with disabilities. Things have changed a lot, but in many ways, things have stayed the same. We, uh, people are living in smaller settings for the most part, but for the most part, what happens for people is still what works best for the staff and for the agency, or maybe for their families, which might or might not be what works best for them. So, as Steve says, one of the things I love about this field is if you can't be a little bit embarrassed about everything you did 15 or 20 years ago, you're not changing enough. You have to, if you're keeping pace, you should be able to look back, as I can, and go, I can't believe that I thought that was right. One of my first jobs in the field was in a day program where we had a guy who had three little containers of three colors of beads, little round wooden beads. We put them in a bowl and mix them up, and his job was to separate them into three bowls. And he could do it, almost do it by the end of the day, and then we'd mix them up and then, you know. Well, nobody is so disabled that they don't know when you're wasting their time. And nobody wants their time to be wasted. And when we think about what people really need, it's really not these discrete skills that we like to teach people. It's much more having a real life. So we know so much more. We have good models to emulate. And yet, what we do is still very much the same. And these are some pictures of people in day programs you know, that, that are from the United States, but probably don't look very dissimilar from what you would see here in Israel. Uh, as uh, Avital said, I always think, is there any field where we're as stuck? And why are we so stuck? And uh, this is what first uh, connected Avital and I. We were at a meeting and I said to her, can you imagine if you went to a heart surgeon and the heart surgeon said, I know that there are all these new ways of doing surgery, but I just like to do it the way I learned in medical school in the 1970s. Uh, yes, more people die, but I'm just more comfortable that way. That's us. What we know what works better for people. We know what produces better outcomes. We know what people want. We know what families want. But we still just keep doing what we've always done because it's more comfortable for us. And so uh, I don't know that there's any other disenfranchised field, any other group of people who, ha who don't have their rights, or many groups of people who don't have their rights. I don't know if there are any other groups that would tolerate being treated in the same ways or having the same access to resources or services that they did 30 or 40 years ago. So while we grinder churning out little institutions. So yes, they're smaller. Uh, I ran an agency that ran group homes. And we had to, not only did we serve people who had lived at the institution, but somebody asked yesterday, what about the people who, who work at the institution? We employed those people. Part of our deal with the state was that we had to employ the people who worked at the institution, which for the most part was good. New people with disabilities, and they had heart for this kind of work. So I went to one of the group homes one of the very first nights, and there were four people that lived in this home. And the woman who was working there, who had been at the institution, she said, OK, everybody, line up. It's dinner time. I went, wait, 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 wait. Why do we line up? It's dinner time. I understand the dinner time part. That's the line up part I'm having trouble with. That's the way they did it at the institution. So she, that's what she knew. And so it, 
So not only did the people who we were serving have to be deinstitutionalized, but the staff needed to be deinstitutionalized. People are still very comfortable with segregation. We don't, uh, we wouldn't tolerate this. These are, pe these are pictures from the civil rights movement, from pre-civil rights movement in the United States when uh, African Americans were segregated from white people. We wouldn't tolerate this in our country, nor in your country would you tolerate this, and yet we're very comfortable with this, which is also segregation. When I say to people this is segregation, they say, well, but not really. And I say, yes, but really. It really is. And with the same results, but we have separate places because it's good for people to be separate, but really not. We learned in the United States that separate but equal really isn't. It's separate, but it's not equal. So somehow we have this tolerance for, for segregation in the disability world that we don't have for any other group. And the day is coming when people won't accept it. People who grow up getting an education alongside their peers who don't have disabilities, they and their families don't want to live in separate places. Uh, now, that's not, of course, 100% true across the board. There are families who say, yes, I do want a separate place for my son or daughter. So what do we do when the person with a disability wants to live in an apartment and have their own life and have a girlfriend and have a job and go to the local place to go swimming, but the family would be more comfortable if he or she were in a, a facility of some kind, a, a group home or a hostel. If you run an agency that, it, that serves adults, your obligation is really to those adults. That doesn't mean ignore the families. It means bring the families along with you. But if we all, even all of us in this room, only did what our mothers and fathers thought we were capable of, we probably wouldn't be here in the room today. I was just telling Steve I was uh, home just uh, a, a week or so ago. It was my mother's 90th birthday. And I'm cutting a cantaloupe. And she says, be careful, that's a sharp knife. <laughs> I cut a cantaloupe or two in my day. I, but you know, our, our mothers, I mean, that's the, that's the nature of mothers. They don't really have high expectations or, or think that you can do everything you can do. So why are we so stuck? Uh, if you ask people, are you happy where you are? They'll say yes. Partly because they know we have worse to offer. Partly because it's just what they're used to. Partly because, as you know, a lot of people with disabilities are used to saying what they think you want to hear. Are you happy? Yes. But if you ask the question a different way, if you say, would, what would you like to be different about your life? If you're really in charge, which you really are, what would you, what would, how would your life be different? You'll hear a lot of things, some of which might make us uncomfortable. But these are our challenges. People, you know, I think there's no greater human impulse than to be in charge of your own life to assert yourself and have choice and not have somebody telling you what to do day in and day out. So we know about this whole idea about serving people individually. It's been demonstrated. Last time we had Lynn Siegel here to speak, she closed her last group homes 25 years ago. She's still going around the country talking about it. I can't think of one thing I did 25 years ago that would be news to you that I could talk about or that people would pay me as a consultant to come and talk about. What we did 25 years ago is great. We should all be doing it by now, but we're kind of stuck and one thing I think is that it's hard to admit that with the best of intentions, with all goodwill, we have limited and restricted and segregated people in ways that aren't fair because we meant well, we weren't trying to restrict people, but we have. And and we think we know better. We think, well, okay, but these are people with disabilities. We do know best what was for them. We have to really believe that people know best what's for themselves and that people really do have a right to make decisions for themselves. 
So sometimes staying where we are is just the most comfortable place to be, but Steve talked about some of these studies. This is one of them. This is a study that looked at 21 other studies. So, you know, one of these big studies that brings together all the information from 21 other studies. And I don't know how easy this is to see. So this is social skills. This is language and communication, self-care, and community living. The blue line is positive impact. The red is no difference, and the green is there was a negative impact. So they looked at when people moved out of institutions, what was the impact? And across the board, people did better in all of these areas. And there are just dozens and dozens of studies that demonstrate that people do better when they're in smaller settings and when they're in charge of their own lives. So you've all heard this saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. So this is forgive them because we, do not, what, we don't do what we know. We know it's better, but we still don't really do it. Uh, we hear all the time from people who want to build a special school or a special camp or a special uh, place to live, and it's going to be have a gate around it, and it's going to be safe. And somehow we just keep perpetuating this kind of separateness when we know that that this is that this isn't what's best for people. So now it's our challenge to work together to do better for people. Uh, we have the same challenge in the United States. Don't, we haven't got all the problems licked. We're right there in the thick of it. Uh, and so this is Maya Angelou. She says, you know, we, let's forgive ourselves for what we know but haven't done. Uh, she says, I did then what I knew then, but now I, I know better. It's, it's my responsibility to do better. So even with the best of intentions, if we've been segregating and restricting and limiting people, uh, it's time to do differently. If you're, for example, running a day program and you consider that this is pre-vocational, what you're teaching in this day program are skills that people need to know to work, you're just trying to soothe yourself. And you're just trying to convince yourself because there's no research study in the world that says that Putting people in day programs where they practice work-like skills leads people to get jobs. We do know how to get people jobs, but that's not it. So you get people jobs by figuring out what people's interests are and what they're good at and what would be a good kind of job for them and helping them get a real job and providing the supports they need to, to be successful. So there is only one difference between um, people who are stuck and people who aren't stuck, and that's this, is that people who aren't stuck, they decided. Uh, it takes facing, knowing, acknowledging that what, you, what you've done in the past, what, what you did, what you knew, but now it's time to do differently. And there is no magic formula. So people sometimes say, but you never really told us how to do it. For those of you who are going to be with us for the next three days, we're really going to dig deep into the how to do it. And also after break today. And also after break today. So we're going to have Annette Downey, who actually runs services, telling us how she did it. We're going to have Michael Small, who's really our national expert in how to listen to people, especially people who don't speak. You know, how, well, okay, it's great if somebody can tell you. You're going to have Liz Weintraub, who's uh, clearly the kind of person who could tell us what kind of life she wants. Uh, but what do you do about people who can't or don't speak, and how do you know what they want and what kind of life for them? And we're going to have John Augusta, who's our national expert on individualized budgeting and how to figure out what people cost and do that in a fair and workable way. So let's talk a little bit about the future here. It's good to have a crystal ball if you're going to talk about the future. So uh, we're going to offer supports that are responsive to what people want, balancing what's important to people with what's important for people. This is a Mike Smallism. You're going to hear from Mike, and uh, maybe he'll talk about this idea. But you know, so. Okay, so we're going to give people their choice. What if they already weigh 300 pounds and their choice is only to eat ice cream? Okay, well, that might be what's important to them, but that's not what's important for them, so it's a balance. But it all then can't be what's important for them either. It's, you know, and so we take that same thing and we say, well, she needs to lose 15 pounds and he shouldn't smoke. 
What do you mean he wants to get a tattoo? No, he can't get a tattoo. So there are some of those things that we like to control about people that really goes too far. We're going to stop making decisions about people based on what slots or, or uh, spaces or beds are available. Um, I visited a Jewish agency in the United States that serves uh, Jewish people in group homes. And I visited their group homes because people always say to me, I know you don't like group homes. You've got something about group homes. You should come see our group homes. So I go see their group homes. They look like every other group home. They look exactly like the group home I worked in when I was you know, 22. So uh, the, the people that run this group home, this agency that runs group homes said, all of our group homes are kosher. So I said, oh, so that's interesting. Is everybody that you serve kosher? Because certainly in the United States, a very small percentage of people who are Jewish are kosher. And they said, no, in fact, we serve probably 30% of the people we serve aren't even Jewish. Oh, well, well, then why are all the group homes kosher? Well, because then if we have to move people around, it's easier. We don't have to worry about who's kosher and not, who's not kosher. They're all kosher. So, OK, we shouldn't be moving people around. We shouldn't be putting people in slots. Most people, the vast majority of people, don't want or need 24 hour a day, seven day a week support. We call it support. They call it bossing them around. None of us would want it either. Can you imagine getting home from the conference today and your husband, wife, partner, roommate says to you, I know there was traffic, but I heard you were late. I hear you didn't come back from the break on time. I heard you looked on Facebook while the person was speaking. So no wine with dinner, and you're going to have to go to sleep without watching that TV show that you like. You know, we can't even imagine it. We're adults. So you know, same thing. So this is a report by three big self-advocacy organizations, organizations of people with disabilities. It's a report of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered, and the National Youth Leadership Network in the United States. Uh, and they say, here's when our rights are restricted. And I'll read it for, for those of you who don't have English. We have to do what we're told, and staff watch our every move. Rules are about what works for the agency or the staff. Activities or the freedom to come and go are limited to what the provider, meaning the agency, will allow. And our ability to have friends or family is limited by the agency in any way. People say, well, we don't limit that. OK, what if he wants to have his girlfriend come over at 2 AM? OK, well, not that. OK, why not that, you know? We're restricted or even punished for expressing our sexuality. People make decisions for us, limiting choices about where to live, food, clothing. And they ended by saying, uh, we want to make our own plans. These are self-advocates, people with disabilities talking, and get support to carry out our plans, even when staff or the provider don't agree with our decisions. So you know, as I said, we think we're good people. So we're making decisions for people. What's wrong with that? And so here's a slide I use to explain to my students. I say, all right, I'm a good person. Uh, I want what's best for you. My students, they're college students, right? So I say to them, here's what I think would be best. You would uh, get up and get some exercise. The women would dress a little more ladylike. Because as Steve says, the women students, they come in the winter in their pajamas, and they come in the summer looking like they're going to, be uh, to the beach. You know, so. Uh, Starbucks, nothing wrong with it. You have Starbucks here? Uh, OK, so it's a coffee place where coffee costs like $5 a cup. You know, Nothing wrong with it, but you could make a whole pot of coffee for the price of one cup. Uh, ha have a healthy breakfast. Facebook, I don't really understand it. You want to look at it once a week, that's OK. Once an hour, I don't get it. You're wasting your time. Alcohol, fattening, don't need it. You need some rain gear. You need to study. and go to sleep early. So I say to my students, I'm not a bad person. We're obviously culturally different. You're probably very glad I'm not in charge of your life. I'm glad you're not in charge of my life, because I don't think I could do what you did last weekend either. So it, you know, everybody, uh, there's no way, even if you're a good person, you could make decisions for people. So we've done some pretty bad things to people in an effort to do right by them. I once, you know, these are kind of the rules that we have in group homes and hostels. I once showed this slide, and a woman in the audience said, 
I don't see what's wrong with that. I have the same rules for my kids. <laughs> oh, well, here's what's wrong. They're not kids, and they're not your kids. So there aren't too many of these. Some of these rules we have for students who live in the college dorms, but we don't even pretend that they follow them. So, you know, no alcohol, you're not supposed to have alcohol, okay. So, you know, and uh, none of us would put up with a life with these kinds of rules. So, so what is a home? You know, we say, well, people live in group homes. These are homes. Uh, and these are some of the, the regulations that our federal government is now saying that agencies that provide services to people with disabilities need to follow. You need to choose where you live and who you live with. Once I did a little evaluation of a group home, and I, here's the only question I asked. I said to the people who live there, so whose place is this? Not one person said, well, it's my place, or me and my roommates. Everybody said it's the agencies or it's the staff. We might think it's a home, but it's not a home. It's not people's home. They know that they can be moved out. If they do very well, they'll get moved into a different kind of place. If they do poorly, if they have behavior problems, they'll get moved back into a different kind of place. People who live there should have keys. And people shouldn't have to ask permission to do any of the kinds of things that adults can do to go out, to eat what they want when they want, to have a pet, to make phone calls. So we focus a lot. Uh, I just proposed this research study. And here's the research study. We would ask uh, staff who work in more traditional group homes and, and um, day programs to describe what their job is in just a sentence or two. And I think direct support staff in traditional kinds of settings would be, they would say, my job is to keep people safe, to pe keep people um, active, to give them things to do, and to teach them new skills. In a more progressive agency where you're really providing individualized supports, I think staff would say to help people figure out what they're interested in, to help them connect to other people who have those same interests, and to live the life that they really want to live and to build relationships. Because having a good life, if you think now, what makes my life good, you're not going to think it's because I'm a great parallel parker or because I can you know, know how to follow the directions and knit a sweater. It's not those things that make life good. It's the people who love you and the people who you love and we really separate people from the people who love them. I think in our own heart of hearts, us being people who work in this field, we don't believe that anybody really wants to be friends with the people we support or employ the people that we support. And if we don't believe it, then we have no way of opening that possibility to all the rest of the people in the community. So we're going to recognize that loneliness might be the worst disability of all. Our goal needs to shift from keeping people busy and safe to really helping people connect in the community, which means we have to hire a different kind of people. And we have to explain to them that your job isn't to keep people busy and safe, but it's to help people connect to their communities, become involved in activities in their communities that are of interest to them, and make friends and be a friend and maintain relationships with their families. So this author says, by our very nature, humans are prepared to be social animals. We are biologically and psychologically prepared for attachment and bonding. Our need for connection is from birth and beyond a fundamental survival need. And she goes on to say, if you could do just one thing that would lengthen your life, help you stay psychologically and physically healthy, and support your healing when you did become ill, you would maintain strong connections to other people. She says, the effects of belongingness are so potent that if they could be bottled, they would need Food and Drug Administration approval. That's the ministry in the United States that approves drugs. It, she says it's so powerful to become connected to people that if we could bottle it, you'd have to get approval from the government. We will finally figure out that it's not only unethical but illogical to respond to people's need to assert control over their life 
by imposing greater and greater amounts of control over them. People say to me, this idea of people living on their own with support, and we're not talking about moving everybody into their own apartment and saying good luck to you. We're saying helping people choose where they want to live, whether they want to live alone, who they want to live with, and then having jobs, becoming involved in recreation, learning to use transportation. We, people always say, does that work for people with severe behavioral issues? What about people who are dangerous or disruptive? And when we ask people who provide these services, they say, for them, it works better than for anybody because once you stop trying to boss them around and tell them what to do all day, they don't have any need to protest. When we stop offering people lives that call for protest, that are worthy of protest, people will stop protesting. Does that mean all behavior problems will go away? No, because some of them have been learned and they've become habits but a good portion of what we're dealing with is people who are resisting being bossed around all day. So we impose the most structure and the most restriction on these people. And this is a, l a little girl named Abby who was in school and uh, the, her doctor said to her, her mother, she needs to be on medicine for her behavior problems. And um, the, I mean, this, this, um, let me make, make sure I said that right. The school said to her mother, she needs to be on, on medicine for her behavior problems. The mother says to the doctor, she needs to be on medicine. The doctor says, let them make me a video. I want to see what's happening in school. And what he saw was a lot of this all day long was the teacher laying her on her stomach and kneeling into her back. And Abby is saying, I'll be good now. I good now. I sit, I quiet, but because she had done some, you know, she pulled a card out of somebody else's hand or she got out of her seat, you know, just a lot of this kind of um, power struggles that lead to more power struggles. And even if we think we use positive behavior approaches, there's a lot of um, coercion and control in even these positive behavior programs. We ask, What's wrong with people? How can we fix him? What are we supposed to do if we can't fix her? So we start off asking all the wrong questions. We want to remake people in our image. When here are the questions that we would hope somebody would ask us if they were in charge of our life. You know, what are you good at? What do you like to do? What's frustrating to you? What would you change about your life? I always think if we picked our college major the way we work with people with disabilities, I would have gone to college and I would have said, OK, well, I was terrible at math and I almost failed chemistry, so I'll major in math and chemistry. But we didn't say that when we went to college. We said, what am I good at? What do I like? What interests me? What would I like to spend my life doing? That's what I'll major in. So we need to look at, if you have a lot of people in your programs who have a lot of behavior problems, we need to look at what they're telling us about our services. They are your best critics. You don't have to hire fancy consultants because they're telling you that they're not happy. And then it's our challenge to figure out how to hire people who's, who don't want to be in charge of people and boss people around, but who want to really support people to have lives of their own. We're not used to hiring that way. We need to think about what questions we ask in the interview to really get to people who want to support people to have the life that they design, rather than people who like to be important and be in charge. We'll realize that you can't give what you don't get. So we ask staff to treat the people who they support as valued, important people who have impact and control over their lives. But our agencies don't treat staff like valued, important people who have impact over their lives. We have all kinds of rules for staff. We control them and we punish them. But we say, don't control and punish the people that you work with. But you can't give what you don't get. So we have to learn how to treat staff as valued, important people who have impact over their lives so that they can offer that to the people with disabilities. I once was doing an annual meeting where we were helping a person figure out what 
he wanted to do with his life and what his goals were for the next year. And one of the direct support staff people said to me, I wish somebody would have a meeting like that with me. I don't, like, I, nobody sits down with me and says, what are your goals? What do you want to do for the rest of the year? So the golden rule being staff do unto others as the administration does unto them. We're going to recognize that institutions and other highly controlled congregate settings are not good for people. They're going to become a, a thing of the past. People don't want them. They're protesting them. People might live in them and accept them, uh, but sometimes people don't know what their other options are. They haven't seen what else is out there. And what's presented to them might seem scary. People have to be uh, exposed to some of the possibilities. We'll get out of our own way and stop isolating people. If every time Avital goes to town, I'm right by her side, nobody's going to interact with her. They figure her needs are met because I'm there interacting and taking care of her all the time. But if she goes into town by herself, she has a lot more opportunity to interact with people. Sometimes our own presence stands in the way of people connecting with people. And we have to generate a whole new generation of leaders who really have the skills and the values to do this, to recognize that our goal isn't to figure out what's wrong with people, but to really support people to have lives of their own. And it starts with you, with you thinking about what you could do in the next three weeks after today, or what you could do in the next six months to just begin to put one foot in front of the other and move in this direction. So I'm not sure how much of this you can see, but we'll send you this PowerPoint if you give Avital your email address. The way we used to think and the, the way we're moving to thinking. So a whole new way of thinking. Here's a Michael Small quote. It's great that I get to go before him. I can use his quotes. You have to think of other things to say. He says, the goal isn't to have a beautiful, is to have a beautiful life, not to have a beautiful plan. We know all the right words. Sometimes I read an agency's mission statement and I think, wow, it sounds great. Then I go and I see it and I think, wow, it looks like every other organization. But we've learned all the right words to say. We know how to write good plans, but do we know how to give people good lives? And it's really in those actions that that makes a difference for people because they don't care what's in your mission statement. Remembering that Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have an annual plan, quarterly goals, and I've learned to do laundry. I don't think Martin Luther King ever did laundry. And we have all these ideas like you have to be able to cook. He can't move into his own place. He's not ready. What does he need to do to be ready? He has to learn how to cook and do laundry. In that case, most of the people at the university where Steve and I work would still be living wherever they used to live because they're not ready either. But they do. They go off and they figure it out and they pay somebody to clean their house. Sometimes it's better to pay somebody to clean your house and do your laundry than to fight with people <laughs> about cleaning their house and doing their laundry. So. This whole thing that Israel is moving towards might feel impossible, but so would carrying a car on your bicycle. That would seem impossible, except to this guy, he did it. So uh, it might seem a little scary. Now, I don't recommend having your child bathe with your boa constrictor. I'm not saying that, but it does. But they both look very happy in this picture. So I'm, I, I, who am I to judge, right? So I'm going to end here. And this is, uh, these are some uh, statements not by any disability expert. This guy was the coach of the Notre Dame football team. You know me. I'm a big football expert, right? He says, in life, there are four essential things to have something to do to have someone to love, to have something to believe in, and something to hope for. And if we could offer that to the people we support, we would have come a long way. And I'm going to stop there and open it up to questions. So this afternoon, you're going to hear an, Annette Downey, who uh, runs an agency that serves thousands of people. And everybody does something that's income producing. 
Now, does everybody earn enough money that they don't need any more public funding? No. But everybody, including people with the most severe disabilities, do something that earns money. In the United States, we have one state, the state of Washington, where for many years there's been public policy that says basically to agencies, we're going to pay you more if you get people jobs. Lo and behold, in that state, the people with disabilities, their unemployment rate is almost matched to the unemployment rate of people who don't have disabilities because there's been a push in that direction. In the states where we say, don't worry about employment, you can just put them in one place and you can give them something to do and they can cut up magazines and they can watch TV, then they don't get jobs. So I don't think it's that employers are unwilling to employ people with disabilities. I don't think we've tried hard enough. It doesn't mean that people are going to get jobs that allow them to pay for their rent and their staff and their food and their electricity and not need any public funding. But jobs, you know, give you a lot more than just income. They give you status. They give you friends. I mean, if you think about your 10 friends, your best friends, probably a number of them are people you met through places you work or used to work. Jobs offer people a lot of inclusion in the world at large. And so I, if we make a real effort towards employment, it's possible. Uh, some uh, agencies here in Israel that run uh, housing services in the community may want to move forward and give more personalizing uh, services for uh, people with disabilities. But uh, they need to uh, be restricted to the uh, government uh, policy in housing services. And some of those restrictions that you refer to them are part of the government uh, policy in uh, housing services. So, so it seems that some of the agencies want to move forward, but the government uh, say in part of the issues, uh, uh, wait a minute. So m maybe there is in, in uh, the United States or in part of the states, there is the, the opposite that the, the states want to move forward uh, uh, before the agencies. So if you can share the, uh, your experience. I, I don't think that uh, there's policy that the states want to move forward instead of the agencies. Um, there are agencies in every state that have moved forward. So the agencies in those states that say, we can't do it because of our government in our state, we say, well, they do it. So I wonder if there aren't some agencies in Israel that are doing it. Um, and of course, there's this whole movement at the government level to figure out what the, the things are, the obstacles that stand in the way of agencies being able to do this. Avital says, our federal government does give incentives. Our federal government just passed a regulation that says that you do need to move in this direction. It's great for us who've been saying we should be doing this anyway, because now even traditional agencies are saying, well, I can't just continue to do what I used to do. I'm going to have to move in this direction. That policy isn't um, in effect yet, but everybody knows that it's coming, and people are realizing that they have to move in this direction. So that is a very, uh, that, that has helped the movement a lot in the United States. Hi. Can you tell us a bit about the um, supervise, the governmental supervise of the NGO organization that uh, dealing with uh, housing in the community? So is the question, how does the government oversee the NGOs that provide the services? Yes. How do they make sure there's quality and things yes. like this? Yes. So yes. in every state, that's done a little bit differently. But generally, there are state um, licensure. You have to have a license, and you have to be accredited. And there are people from the state who come in. Now, the thing is, most of the stuff that those licensure people look at really isn't 
what makes for quality. You know, you could run an agency that has no licensure problems, but still people don't have a very good life. And conversely, you could run an agency where people have really good connected lives, but you don't check off all the boxes. You know, you're supposed to have one bath towel and two hand towels and a full length mirror and, you know, stuff that's like, okay, but that's not what makes for a good life. So. Uh, they, there is government oversight. I don't know that those government oversight people are always looking for the things that best correlate with quality in terms of what makes for a quality life. So it's a bit of a problem. It's not practical. You don't have you know, the rule how to uh, supervise uh, the housing industry. No, no I, every agency does it differently. And so as long as the outcome, we also have um, uh, voluntary standards that you could choose to meet, accreditation standards. So you could meet this higher level of standards so that you can say, we meet this high level of standards. And those standards really look <laughs> not at process. They don't care how you get there. They look at outcomes and they say, do people have control of their money? Do they have friends? Do they have jobs? Doesn't really matter what steps you took to get there as long as the outcomes are positive. Do you ask the clients or do you ask the NGOs? Uh, uh, they interview the people who receive services directly. And when it's not possible for people to answer themselves, they meet with that person with other people who know and care about that person. There is, a uh, Steve talked too about this set of federal uh, measures, uh, the national core indicators that where we measure people across all the states on a bunch of things. And we've learned a lot of fascinating information from this ton of data from all the states, almost every state across the United States. So many interesting things that came out that we didn't know, like the the number of people who are on psychotropic drugs, drugs to control psychiatric problems who have no psychiatric diagnosis. So why are they on these drugs? Really just to control their behavior. So there are these also, this big database. The whole, you know, all of that together doesn't solve every possibility of things not going well. Uh, question here. What is the role of the government? Uh, so uh, most services. It, how it is in your country, and how do you think it has to be? Uh, I missed the second part. How it is in our country, and. And how do you think it has to be? Uh, so in our country, it's uh, the money comes from a, a match between the federal government and the state government. You have to meet criteria in order to qualify to get funding. It, the same funding funds people with a variety of disabilities, although agencies might only serve one type of person or another. Um, and um, then the, that money comes through the states, and the states regulate who gets it, and they do the oversight in terms of quality. The problem is states are really, they could say, well, this agency, it's not terrible, but it's not good. And that's, that agency could continue to operate for a long time because the state has no other choice. What are they going to do with the 120 people who that agency serves? So there are a lot of agencies that continue to operate that don't do terrible things, but they're not really good, but they just continue. So. Not supervising? Uh, it, it, say that again? Uh, the state has limited resources to supervise, so they might come in and do a little look uh, once a year, but they don't really supervise as closely as one would hope. And then again, what they're looking for when they come isn't always the indicators of, of quality. If we could design what they would look for, we'd all come up with better things than what they actually look for. Some of the things I look for are indicators of against quality. You know, do they make up their menus two weeks in advance and have those posted in the kitchen and have a dietitian look at them? Well, we would say you should be able to say, 
I know I took out some chicken to defrost for dinner, but I'm going to stop on the way home and get a pizza because I don't feel like making chicken. That's what I do about it every day. Sheila. Yes. כשאוכלוסייה עם צרכים מיוחדים משולבת בקהילה, קשה לי לראות אותם משולבים באמת. בסופו של דבר הם תמיד מרגישים את עצמם פחות טובים מאשר האחרים, ובעצם הם חיים בשוליים, על יד הקהילה, ואני מדברת את זה מניסיון שהבן שלי היה משולב בקהילה, ולדעתי זה קצת... צבוע להגיד שזה משולב, הוא עבד במקום שהיה לו גם טוב, בבית חולים, אבל להגיד שהוא משולב בקהילה, זה לא. Right, so this is really the job of our agencies is to make sure that people don't feel marginalized. Uh, in the United States, children are going to school, children with disabilities and children who don't have disabilities are in classes together now. Not when I was in school, there was nobody in my classes. So, but when I asked my students, how many of you had students with disabilities in class with you in, you know, throughout your schooling, almost all of them did. And so we're hoping that once we have a world where people went to school with people with disabilities, they played on the playground, they went to synagogue or church with people with disabilities, Some of this will dissipate, and then it's really the job of staff, not just to get somebody a job, but to help them really connect. And it's always going to be a challenge. There are people who, you know, are always going to feel um, behind, you know, like struggling a little bit to be the same as others. And it's always going to be something we're going to have to support people so that they can feel connected. But there are lots and lots of people who live in communities, who are part of committees, who are part of different kinds of recreational activities, who you know, don't go to the bowling league for people with disabilities, but just bowl on the regular league. But it's true, it's, it can be a struggle for people. Because people want to be also in something that is the best, and not to be always the best than others. And because of that, in the peer group, when they're looking, they're looking to be with people דומים להם, שהם גם יכולים להיות הכי טובים, הכי טובים בפוליטיקה, הכי טובים בלקפוץ בקלאס, לא יודעת, כל אחד במשהו אישי, אני חושבת שזו אוטופיה. So it's going to be different for every person, right? And we're going to hear from Liz Weintraub, who would say, I think, I don't want to live just with other people with disabilities. I want to live with all kinds of people, but this isn't true of everybody. Everybody's an individual and people are going to... have different ideas. Martin Luther King I have a dream. אני מדברת גם לפי סקרים, כל החיים גם כתבתי ספר על הסיכה החברתית, כי אני חושבת שכשבונים תוכנית כזאת צריך לחשוב גם על הפרט. כל אחד זקוק למשהו אחר, לא לשלול תוכניות. הפיקוח הוא מאוד חשוב, וצריך כל תוכנית, אם זה בקבוצתי, אם זה אינדיבידואלי, צריך לעבוד על האינטגרציה החברתית של בן אדם, הקבלה, על עבודה, העבודה, שיר, המוטיבציה שלו, הערך עצמי, כל תוכנית שבונים שלא מבוסס על הדברים האלו, אני מאוד אדלריאני, וכדי להגיע לאושר של בן אדם, הבן אדם צריך להרגיש שיש לו שייכות בחברה, בעיקר בחברה, אז הבן אדם צריך אה, להרגיש... כן. I אה... totally agree with you. אוקיי, הבן אדם צריך להרגיש שהוא בקבוצת השווים, 
ואותו דבר קורה לנו עם ההורים שלנו, שמגיעים לתקנה. היום יש המון מוסדות של הגיל השלישי, מכיוון שגם בגיל המבוגר הבן אדם צריך להיות באותה קבוצה של... אוקיי. <laughs> I agree with everything you say, except that people need to live uh, separately in order for that to happen. I do think we need to work on self-esteem and confidence and provide emotional support. I think that that can happen in amongst all the places where everybody else lives. I don't think we can ignore those important parts of people. I don't think people, I, I think having people live just people with disabilities together contributes to people not feeling as good about themselves rather than feeling better about themselves. We are going to move on to Liz Weintraub.